right, good morning to you all and welcome to this launch of National Career Development Week. First of our special guest speakers today is in fact an ambassador for uh, NCDW. He is of course David Werpanda. David made his debut, he was drafted in fact at the age of 16 and he made his debut playing with uh, West Coast in round five of the 1996 AFL season at 16 years of age, well to be precise in fact, 16 years 268 days and he remains the Eagles' youngest ever debutante. At the end of round 22 in 2009, he had played in 227 of a possible 327 games or matches for the Eagles, and he'd scored 131 goals. He's also known for his community work, his efforts in helping to improve the lives of young Indigenous Australians first and foremost through the David Werpunda Foundation that he launched, in fact, back in 2005. In 2009, in fact, David announced his retirement. But last year, he decided to undertake full-time work in the foundation that bears his name. He is an inspiration to all of us. Would you please welcome David Werpunda. David. <laughs> Well, it's a pleasure to be here this morning to uh, speak to you guys about my personal journey and also some of the things that I've uh, decided to do in my career and also personally as a person that have helped me along the way and, uh, and hopefully you guys get something out of it because uh, it's an interesting story and like Steve said before, we all have uh, different strokes for different folks and everyone's very different in their own right and I suppose at the end of the day it's what you're prepared to do. Uh, will determine your future and how far you really want to go. Um, I basically grew up in a place called Shepparton, which you may be uh, aware of, um, in Country Vic. And uh, from there on, I learned some of the most Im important values uh, to me as a person. That's me being the young Aboriginal person that I am. And my father's from North East Arnhem Land in Northern Territory. So I was always going back from, from Shepparton to uh, Northern Territory. And my dad, to this very day, can't speak English. So. I learned how to speak my language from Arnhem Land and I used to come back and forth from seeing my family in, in NT and, and Shepparton but the difference was is that when I came down from Northern Territory I started my mainstream education and going to classrooms what you guys do which was very very different because I started my schooling in a little place, a little community called Durbuchby which is just out of Gove. And there it's very very different because your teachers are basically your aunties and uncles and, and your grandparents. Uh, then all of a sudden I started school in Shepparton and then came down to the Yarra Valley in Hillsville. I'll never ever forget the first day at school. Um, my, my teacher was named uh, Mrs Liston and uh, I remember walking into that school and that school was existing at the time for 98 years and I was the very first Indigenous man or Indigenous person to go to that school. So when I walked in everyone just freaked out <clears throat> and everyone jumped off the carpet. So I jumped off the carpet with them. Um, and I thought this must be some kind of game and I looked at the teacher and then she was on the chalkboard looking at us all and I've jumped back onto the carpet and then everyone's on. So we did that for about a minute. <clears throat> and, I, and I couldn't understand what was going on and thinking what's everyone doing but they were, they were freaked out. They, a lot of those young kids didn't have any contact with Indigenous people. If anything they, they read about us and, they, um, and seen a lot of us on TV and, and probably Cathy Freeman was the only thing that they had they could relate to me as, at, at that time. Uh, and I found that a massive challenge and the thing was is that this is, I knew that this was going to be very difficult for me because I had to sit there as a young person thinking why can't I just sit here and, and it's hard enough as you would all know when you go to a new school let alone being uh, what kind of race, colour you are and different hair, doesn't matter. Um, that's hard enough as it is. So I had to try and figure out different avenues on how I could fit into the rest of the class. So I spent three years at that school trying to fit in and I found different ways of doing it. So I went down and I thought, well, what does everyone love doing? Went down to the courts, <coughs> seen everyone playing um, sport. 
And I hated sport. I hated anything that made me sweat. Anything. I was, if I could crawl most of my life and sleep it away, I would. Uh, so I ended up joining in and trying to break into uh, just, you know, everyone in my classroom in particular. So I wanted to make friends with everyone so I could fit in. And everyone loves sports, so the first thing I went and did, and I, I went, went and started playing netball with all the girls, and I think that was the worst thing that I could have done. <laughs> Uh, because they had a question mark on me from there on, so all the boys were teasing me even more. Uh, but that was that was just my way of trying to trying to get to know all these people. And there was a girl named Belinda who was the best at maths in our class, and she was a netballer. So I thought, well, that's a good way of trying to learn. Uh, but along the way, I had a difficult time trying to do that, and I started to figure out very early uh, in my at, you know at, at the time of of how to structure up different ways and different avenues to try and fit in. And then I related that to the rest of my life because it, it didn't stop there. And at the time, I was I, my family from Victoria are very political. So I grew up a lot of the time in the back of the car uh, watching Aboriginal land rights and watching my family fight for Aboriginal land rights, which was very hard to, to take and very um, difficult to do. But at the same time, I learned to love it at, as well. I had an understanding very early on what my grandmother was um, trying to do for us as, as Aboriginal people. And I used to wake up in AGM meetings watching her throw cups of tea at, at some bloke uh, that may be denying us the rights for, for land in, in particular regions of Victoria. And I used to freak out, I'd think, what is she doing? And this poor bloke's sitting on the end of the table with tea all over him and, and, and a scone across his forehead. <laughs> and, I, and I thought to myself, well, my, my grandmother's my biggest idol. She's my biggest inspiration. And, uh, and I knew that what, what she was doing. So along the way, my education was disrupted because we were too busy trying to save everyone else's lives and fight for Aboriginal politics. And that's part and parcel of what you have to do. So I had to think about how I was going to get about, uh, get about getting a better education because I was missing school, I didn't have stability in my life and I didn't really have, um, I couldn't finish a term of school because one minute we'll be in Victoria, next minute we'll be in Sydney and then we could be in Canberra, waking up in a tent listening to all these old elders screaming and yelling because that's what we were prepared to do because it's very, very different for us. And at the time, I'm thinking, geez, I, I, don't, want it. I don't want this life. I want, I want to have it like, uh, like any other kid where you just go to school and you, uh, you have friends and, and that's, that's your life as a young kid. And uh, I started to think, well, what am, what's David Werapunda going to do? So I was in a situation one day where I had to try and make uh, decisions for my family. And being a young person, <laughs> my family didn't really have the most comfortable lifestyle from a financial point of view, so I had to think of ways of getting around that. And one of the things that I, I was influenced by is for, uh, someone from my, uh, my brother, actually, and my uncle. And my brother <coughs> is very, very good at breaking the law. He's a genius. And I thought to myself, I don't want to have that life. I don't want to have that um, the pressure of, of having that lifestyle. Um, I want to try and find a different way. And my brother spent a lot of time growing up in and out of jail, and that was the way I knew my brother. Um, but I understood what he was doing. And even though I loved my brother and, and he was a bad influence, he was, the best ca uh, he was the best example of the worst example for me. But he was my brother. And he was, had to do things that would blow your mind just to make sure that we had food on the table so I could have uniforms at school and um, I can go on school excursions, just those little things that, that you guys would do. Uh, so I thought to myself, well, I'm going to have to assist here some way from a financial point of view. So I started to play, uh, play sport and I hated it. But when I started in Hillsville um, in under, under 11s, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. And my first game, my grandmother and my mum were in the bus. And, and if you can just picture an oval, uh, the coach said to me, you're playing in the forward pocket. And I said, where's that? He said over towards uh, where the goalposts were was a massive uh, power line. He says over towards the power line. So I've walked out of the ground, <laughs> past, past my nan, my nan and mum are in the bus having a tea, watching me, and I went and stood next to the power line. <laughs> and I was about 15 metres away from the ground, and they said, where's, where's David gone? They used to call me David W because they couldn't say my name. And he said, he's that little black kid right at the back. 
But the thing was, is that I taught myself, and I was and I, and I was frustrated, but I, I I I could I could follow instructions, and that was something that I had to force myself to do because I didn't know it any other way. So I, I used to wait for people to give me instructions to be able to go and do things because I wasn't used to asking questions. Uh, and whenever someone said something, I would I would try and put it in my head, and I say, okay, he said that, that's what I'm doing. Um, and then. I started to play a little bit of sport and I hated it, but the coach ended up coming to see me when I was 11, started paying me 100 bucks a game. And at the time I was almost pretty much illiterate and I, was, I think I was going into grade, grade six this time. Because I, had, I was never staying at school, I didn't have any stability, um, that, that was my um, downfall. I, I, I couldn't read or write. I, I was desperate and I had asp aspirations one day to either go into law or I wanted to be an architect. And you have to be good with numbers with that way. So this bloke came to me one day, his name was John Pitcher, and he says, uh, David, we'd like you to come down and stay with us at under 11s, 50 bucks a game. And all the other kids were getting, had to pay 50 cents for their jumper. So I'm thinking, I'm making money here. So I started to look at that more seriously. And by the time I was 13, uh, I knew that I was behind the eight ball as far as um, education. I went to Forest Hill Secondary College uh, for 12 months and, and I really struggled. And I was 14 at the time and I, I just knew that I had to make decisions really quickly uh, to be able to give myself the best opportunity in life. And I was so desperate to, to have a, a good education. My dream was to finish, finish VCE before anything and I was so far behind the ball. So I had to start thinking, how am I going to get around this? Uh, and, I, and I knew that I had to roll the dice with my life if I was to eventuate in sport. And it ended up going that way. Because the following year, West Coast Eagles came to me, knocked on my door, and said, we like you, we think you can play. Um, would you like to come to West Coast? I said, no. I said, I hate you blokes. I hate <laughs> West Coast. I hate you, I can't stand you. Um, um, I'm not interested. And, uh, and at the time, this is all very personal stuff. My brother was going through court, uh, we all were actually, uh, for abalone diving. And that's how desperate we were uh, to make some money at the time, is that I used to go down to Phillip Island uh, with my brother, go abalone diving, and it would be two o'clock in the morning, I'd be strapped to the back of his tank with a uh, spear gun, torch, and we used to shell the abalones underwater as quick as we possibly could. I shouldn't even be telling you this, but this, this, is, a lead, this is a lead up to my decisions. Uh, and I'll never ever forget because if, uh, underwater you could see this boat coming and this big blue light and it was the fisheries. So the fisheries have caught my brother for the fourth time and they've caught me for the first time. And at this time I'm thinking, what am I doing? And I'm freezing. But what we used to do is grab all the abalones, drive all the way back to, to Melbourne, to Chinatown, we used to go straight into the restaurant, 7.30 in the morning, freezing cold, with our wetsuits, and every, people will be having breakfast like right now. And we'll be going straight through the crowd to the, to the back, and we used to start negotiations per kilo with the head chef. Sometimes we walk out with 10 grand, sometimes we walk out with 500 bucks, but we were desperate. And we were making decisions based around being desperate, which is the wrong thing to do. And I'll never ever forget the feeling, because when we got caught, my brother tapped me on the shoulder and uh, the, uh, the fisheries, they have the power to basically confiscate everything that you got. And we, they took the car, they took the clothes on our back and just left, left us just with a, a pair of shorts. And it was the worst feeling I've ever felt. And my brother, I looked at him in, in great disappointment. He looked at me and I seen him and he, he was hurt. And he tapped me on the shoulder and he goes, don't ever, ever um, do this again and don't, I don't ever want you to feel like this.